Tonight we're going to talk about fiction. We're going to talk about my book called The Sower. So The Sower refers to, the title comes from the parable of The Sower, which is a reference to uh, something from the Bible. This is not the Bible. <laughs> it's a thriller. And it's kind of a twisted thriller, and I'll give you the basic premise. Uh, there's a guy who becomes infected with this virus. But this virus, instead of making people sick, cures all diseases. And he is the sole carrier of this incredible miracle. But the only way to pass it to others is through sex. So I'm going to tell you something about this guy. So this guy has this incredible miracle that he's the chosen person for this incredible uh, uh, gift of the world. Uh, he's really not a very great guy. He's actually, uh, in, I guess in the nicest way you can put it, is he's a playa, as they say. Uh, and he's a playa in the world of San Francisco. And he has a secret. Uh, so this guy who is, is wildly promiscuous, uh, narcissistic certainly, uh, has finally met someone who likes. It's like the first person ever we actually wanted to like be with. Uh, like for more than, say, 15 minutes. <laughs> so uh, the scene I'm going to take you to is actually set in a real place in San Francisco, and basically he's with this guy, a guy's name is Ike. The uh, main character's name is Bill Swallow. S-O-I-L-E-A-U. It's a Louisiana name. <laughs> we'll double on time with it. So he is with this guy who he likes, and, uh, but he has trouble uh, opening up. Uh, so I'm going to read a little bit of the book <clears throat> Bill Swallow sipped his cafe au lait. The cup was comically huge, like a prop from the old TV show, Land of the Giants. Sweet Inspiration Dessert Shop was famous for its large portions, and the rich coffee was a perfect match for the mocha cheesecake melting in his mouth. The slice was enormous, too. Who could ever finish all this? Out the window, he stared at Beck's Motor Lodge across the street, a classic three-story motel from the 1950s, spiffed up with a new coat of shocking salmon-colored paint with bright blue trim. Anyone driving by might easily dismiss it as nostalgic kitsch. Bill knew the truth. A U-shaped complex on busy Market Street, Beck's rooms all had large windows that looked out onto landings that hugged each floor. A constant parade of visitors walked past the rooms and peered inside. Eager guests kept their drapes open and flaunted their naked bodies across their beds to offer themselves. If a passerby liked what he saw, he knocked on the glass to be let inside. After midnight, the displays became more outrageous. Hotel patrons ingratiated themselves for the window shoppers or staged open door orgies, all in an attempt to lure more men. Bill had done the Beck's walk more times than he cared to remember. On nights when he felt an urgent need and wasn't too particular, he'd pick a room number in his head before arriving and fuck whoever turned out to be there. Other times he'd wander around each of the floors and take note of every turned up bare butt until he settled on one that appealed to him most. After the first, he'd need only a few minutes before he was ready to see what knelt behind the next door. Now from the safe distance of the cafe, he watched men climb the stairs and circle the landings. Shopping malls had less foot traffic, he thought. Staring into the dollop of milk foam on his drink, he was suddenly glad for simple pleasures, coffee and cake. If things were different, he might be one of those men across the street, condemned to pace in search of flesh. What are you thinking? I said as he sat back down next to Bill. Bill hesitated. Why hold back? He felt comfortable putting anything on the line for Ike. This is where he talks about his secret. Then we'll come back. So after he has that conversation, with Ike, we'll start, the conversation starts again in the cafe. What about your family? I asked. You have six brothers and sisters, and your mother. You couldn't talk to any of them about your secret? He looked appalled. His mother. Bill didn't have to wonder what she'd be doing right now. It was Saturday night in Baker, Louisiana. She'd be drunk on homemade daiquiris with her lady friends, smoking Paul Malls and all complaining about the men who'd left them. His dad died when Bill was just 10, leaving Mom to raise and manage the entire brood. Five boys and two girls, with Bill invisible in the middle. 
Mom's drinking had started when Dad was still alive. It was always worse around the holidays. He remembered one New Year's Eve when he was no older than five. All the kids were pulled out of their beds and plopped in front of the TV to watch the ball drop in Jew, York City. When midnight finally came, his parents went crazy and started banging on the top of the set because an old episode of The Tonight Show was on. New Year's Eve had already happened the night before. They'd missed it because they'd both been on a 48-hour bender. Then there was Christmas when he was seven. All the kids raced downstairs that morning to see what Santa had brought them. Mom and Dad were passed out in the living room. A near-empty bottle of Gilby still sat on the green-stained coffee table. Remarkably, they both woke up in fairly good moods as the kids hunted down their presents under the tree and ripped open the wrapping. Maria and Sheila beamed over matching Barbie dolls. Frank couldn't believe he'd finally gotten the BB done, and Dad proudly explained that it was a rite of passage for his eldest son. Four-year-old Sean loved his fire truck with sound effects mimicking a siren and the squawking voices of the dispatch radio. Baby Donald gummed his new TV rings. Bill looked everywhere for a gift under the tree with his name on it. The excitement of the moment was quickly replaced by shallow breaths of panic. Mama, Bill said, I think Santa forgot me. What the fuck, Mom said as she peeled herself off the couch. She bent down under the tree and started searching. She pushed the gifts aside, but as her frustration grew, she began throwing them against the wall. Bill put his arms on his head and started crying. For Christ's sake, stop your crying. You grow up to be a goddamn sissy, she yelled. Sam, tell him to stop crying. Stop crying, Dad did panned. Jesus, exasperated, Mom flopped back down on the couch. There was no gift under the tree for Bill. She pointed at Sean. You, what I do, Sean said defensively. That there truck, Mom continued to point, that there is for the two of you to share. Bill couldn't believe it. Share? No one had ever been asked to share in the history of Christmas. <laughs> Mom, that's not for me. That's a toy for a 40-year-old. The tears now started to come faster. Stop your crying, mister. You sit the fuck down there and cheer that truck with your brother. Mom chuckled. <laughs> then her expression changed to one of complete self-satisfaction with her decision. Like she was Solomon and had just found a brilliant solution to the problem. She nodded her head in agreement with herself and said, Santa said so. <laughs> Bill sat down next to Sean. How could Santa forget it? How could Santa want it to share with his kid brother? He reached over and touched the shiny chrome on the truck's ladder. Sean seethed. No, mine. And then in a whisper for only to Bill to hear, sissy. A loud clanking sound brought Bill out of the memory. It was Mike banging his fork on the side of the cafe au lait. Hey, K3 boy, did you hear what I asked? What about your family? Why couldn't you turn to them in your hour of need? I'd always heard that Southern families could be so warm and loving, especially in Louisiana. Not all of them. Bill tried to force a smile. Thank you.